Great, thank you. I hope you enjoyed uh, my conversation with uh, the vice chairman. He's an old friend of mine, and um, it's always good to take some what are sometimes private conversations and bring them on the stage. And then the two previous panels we had this morning, I thought were quite good. And it shows most of those are my board members, so you have a sense of what my board discussions are like. Uh, and uh, just the really exciting and interesting people that I have, have the opportunity to deal with on a regular basis. I'm going to use the rest of this time before we go to lunch. I'm going to bring Douglas Flint out. He's the chairman of HSBC and the chairman of the IIF in about uh, 15 minutes or so. But I wanted to use the uh, prerogative of the chairman to offer just uh, some personal reflections in a time in which there's such great uncertainty uh, and great turmoil. And I, first, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the great challenges on the financial landscape. Much of this was discussed earlier today, but I'll just replicate or repeat what I said to Stan, which is weak global growth, certainly a great concern. Central banks' policy exhaustion, uh, no matter where you go around the world, most of the central banks, the main central banks, are running pretty close to their limit as to what they can do, and certainly there's diminishing returns as to the policies in place. Uh, the global skills gap, we talked a little bit about that. According to a global manpower survey, firms are facing uh, increasing difficulty in filling positions. 34% uh, of firms surveyed in the United States have a tough time bringing talented, qualified individuals into jobs. And that may be part of the job story in the U.S. and also part of the politics story. I talked a little bit about the wedge of my wedge of worry, and that's where we see debt relative GDP continue to rise at about a 45 degree angle. It's been occurring now for several decades. It isn't abating. And at the same time, there's a downward trajectory in the opposite direction, which is productivity, marginal efficiency of capital, and return on investment. Those two trend lines are not sustainable. It reminds me of 2004, 2005. Housing prices continue to go up, but real disposable income continue to go down. Eventually, you have to have a bend in either the amount of debt we're issuing relative to GDP, or we're going to have to raise productivity. And remember, uh, uh, bending the curve on debt, which is a liability, means that that's someone else's asset, which means assets have to be adjusted as well. But the real issue I think we're confronting is populism. Uh, and we've seen a surge of it. It's anti-trade, anti-immigration, anti-globalization, anti-banking. And there's this nostalgic hunger for some mythical golden year. In the United States, one party thinks it's the 1950s, the 1980s. The other party thinks it's the 1930s and the 1960s. But there is this sense that there was this wonderful, great time we lived in, this harmonic sense of abundance. And we just have to go back to that. For those of us who are committed to free trade and open markets, it's been an incredibly difficult year. Uh, but I've been out there on the hustings trying to continue to make the case for open markets for trade. And for all those forces, which I'll get into in a minute, have had a profound positive impact on our life. And I started with uh, a young constituency because they're much more impressionable. And the constituency I started with were my three children in my own home. So this summer, on our summer vacation, they said, Dad, we want to go to Disneyland. And I said, that's great. I'll take you to California. I never mentioned Disneyland in the offer. I said, but I want to teach you something about globalization. And they said, Dad, what's globalization? And I said, well, let, let's go to California, and you'll know by the end of the trip. So our first stop was at the Golden Gate Bridge. At the time it was unveiled or finished in 1937, it was the longest suspension bridge in the world. It was a true engineering marvel. But the story of the bridge itself is really, really remarkable itself. It is about globalization. Those who worked on the bridge were mostly newly arrived immigrants who came in the great waves of 1905 to 1919. Three of the top engineers were born in Europe, Ireland, Latvia, and Switzerland. And the chief engineer was the son of a German immigrant. There's a great book by author Schwartz who looks at the oral history of those who worked on the Golden Gate Bridge large percentage of them were uh, uh, newly arrived immigrants. And they tell great stories about literally getting off the boat and going to work as uh, steel workers on the, on the bridge. The key financier, the key financier was A.P. Giannini, the son of Italian immigrants, founded a small bank in San Francisco, uh, targeted at the area's immigrant and working class population. And the bank was so successful that Giannini actually ended up purchasing an, ever, an even larger bank. That bank was the Bank of America, which became one of the great banks, certainly the great banks on the West Coast, but one of the great banks in the United States and is still today. 
And when funding dried up for the bridge in the 1930s because of the Depression, A.P. Giannini wrote a check to support the building and completion of the Golden Gate Bridge. He single-handedly financed the bridge, the son of Italian peasants. Giannini also went on to support the motion picture industry, funding Charlie Chaplin and Walt Disney, so that's my Disney connection. Also, uh, the uh, California wine industry, so the next time you're sipping a nice uh, Napa or Sonoma Cabernet, you should think A.P. Giannini and later made the first loans to Bill Hewlett and David Packard of Hewlett Packard. So he's really one of the beginning geniuses behind funding the tech sector. But more, but more importantly today, 75 years later after it was built, it still stands, the bridge, as a great icon of the 20th century of globalization. By the way, does anyone know what the color of the Golden Gate Bridge is? International orange. International orange. We need more bridges, not walls. Bridges, not walls. So my kids liked that idea, but they still were asking about Disneyland. I said, well, you know what? We'll head south. So we did. I took them to Silicon Valley. We went uh, starting south of uh, Soma, the Market Street, south of Market Street in San Francisco. Uh, we made our way down to Google and spent the day uh, walking around Google campus. Uh, and it's... If, for those of you who have not been to the Google campus, it really does look like, it, it, and it is a globalized workforce. It looks like something from the UN General Assembly. There aren't enough women there, that's for sure. And the tech sector generally knows they have a gender gap problem and they're working on it. But as we were sitting in the lunchroom, and my children really liked the idea that it was all the food you could eat was free and all the free ice cream you could consume. They looked around the room and they said, you know, this is an interesting group of people because they were also, but they were all from around the world. It truly is a global, a global representation. And the interesting thing about Silicon Valley is there is no real single icon, like the bridge is of the, of the 20th century, but it's because the 21st century is about knowledge, it's about ecosystems, it's about creativity, it's about these inanimate things that really will dominate and determine the course of my children's lives. The profile of the Google workforce, as I said, is reflective of Silicon Valley generally. Consider the following. While 13% of the US population is foreign born, one fourth of tech and engineering companies created in the last 10 years was founded by an immigrant. In Silicon Valley, the number is 44%. So think about 44% of Silicon Valley firms launched in the last 10 years was launched by an immigrant founder. More than 40% of Fortune 500 companies are founded by an immigrant or a child of an immigrant. Immigrants were the founders of more than half the American startup companies now valued at a billion dollars or more. And more generally, immigrants are twice as likely to start a business as are native-born Americans. Companies founded by immigrants or co-founded include Google, Tesla, PayPal, eBay, Yahoo, Intel, YouTube, and Instagram. Those are brands that are in my house 24-7. And it's not just in Silicon Valley. Innovation is global. And whether it's Berlin or London or Bangalore or Singapore, these same factors are at work. You know, the discussion about Brexit and London as a truly global workforce is yet another example of what these ecosystems of creativity look like. They look like a global workforce. I've shared these stories about San Francisco and Silicon Valley because the current political climate I find troubling. For those of us operating in and around the financial industry, we need to do a better case and make a better case for an open economy. And let me just start and give a little bit of a global backdrop. And I mean a real global backdrop, a long-term backdrop. Starting with the Neolithic era, yes, Neolithic, 10,000 BCE, until about the mid-19th century, the human condition did not change. It did not change. In fact, weight, height, caloric intake, and average life expectancy was basically the same from about 7,000 BCE until the 19th century. Now think about that. When Thomas Hobbes wrote that life is nasty, brutish, and short, he wrote it about an entire period of time of known human existence, certainly of recorded human existence. And the perception was that life would never change. 
but it did change. Starting in the mid-19th century, a whole host of things came together. The Enlightenment, uh, the issue of property rights and political freedom and human rights, and of course, the great Scottish philosopher, Adam Smith, who wrote not only The Wealth of Nations, but even better book that no one, I bet no one in this, uh, this auditorium has read, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, where he talked about the importance of humility, benevolence, and prudence. But all these things came together and the human condition began to change at a dizzying pace. Living standards doubled starting in the early 19th century and doubled again about every 35 years, every 35 years. So you went from a period of flat uh, 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 life expectancy and the human condition for 12,000 years and then it simply took off. Finance was a key part of that. Yale professor William Goetzman, who's just written a great book entitled Money Changes Everything, notes that the net effect of those forces on economic growth from finance was remarkable. And the integration of the global economy, we are a lot of anti-globalization going on. The front page of the Wall Street Journal today talked about anti-globalization. But think about just in my lifetime how profoundly different the world has become. Since 1950, the average life expectancy globally has increased from 48 to 71. As I mentioned earlier, my children have a 60% probability to live to 105. Their children to 120. Remarkable changes. Global literacy rate has increased from 42 to 85 percent, and girls' education has, has also changed remarkably, but needs to uh, do better. The share of the global population living in absolute poverty has fallen from 50 percent, 50 percent, to now 11 percent. Since 1990, more than a billion people have escaped extreme poverty, and the ranks of the global middle class have swelled by hundreds of millions. And while the inequality has increased within some countries, the gap between countries has narrowed and narrowed precipitously. Access to capital and financial services has surged by 700 million over the last five years, and three billion people now have access to financial activities. There's a great uh, 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 professor at Oxford University, Max Rozier. If you're not on his Twitter feed or if you're not aware of his we website, you should go to it. Max Rozier does a great job of laying out some of these longer-term economic trends. In the words of former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, who said it better than I could have, the poor are not poor because of too much globalization, but because of too little. Now, that said, there are tough times in many advanced countries. And we see it every single evening play out with respect to the political discourse in this country and other countries. And let me give you a little bit of a personal insight into that. I grew up in a small town in western Kentucky, a town of about 9,000. There was a tap and appliance plant that my sister worked at. She was a single parent at the time with two young children, and that appliance plant, which produced washers and dryers and other white goods, shut down and moved out of the country. She was unemployed. It was a Fisher Price toy plant, which was the great employer in my hometown. If you graduate from high school and you didn't go to college, and most didn't go to college, that was the place to go work. Great benefits, great pay, not the greatest, most interesting jobs, but it was a great place to get a middle-class life. And maybe you had an acre of tobacco that produced your Christmas money. Fisher Price shut down and moved to Mexico and then ultimately to China. So I saw firsthand 55-year-old men sitting in their front yards in their lawn chairs, essentially drink themselves to death or abuse opioids or other substance abuse. It is heart-wrenching to see an economy, especially a small system, a small town, go through rapid economic change. But I've also seen the positive sides of globalization. When I was a graduate student at the University of Kentucky, I worked for a social anthropologist, and our first job was to collect demographic data for Georgetown, Kentucky which would soon be the place of a newly announced Toyota production facility. That facility today employs 6,000 people, really great jobs. I have friends of mine who I went to college with who were employed there, and there are hundreds of satellite vendors that feed into that plant that produce and support tens of thousands of other jobs, not only in Kentucky, but in the neighboring states. So on the one side, there's a human tragedy I watched as jobs were lost. But on the other hand, I saw over time wonderful jobs occurring and developing other places because of foreign direct investment. 
Sometimes it's not just about globalization. It's not about trade going one place or other. It's sometimes it's about technological change. How many people here have ever worked in a factory on assembly line? Yeah, not many. I did. I worked at the General Electric uh, of the lighting plant. We produced headlamps and other fluorescent and halogen bulbs in Lexington, Kentucky. I worked there when I was in college. Fortunately, I didn't spend much time on the assembly line. I ended up getting a job in the accounting office where there was actually heat in the, in the winter and air conditioning in the summertime. It was a great place to work. In fact, I became a GE stockholder starting in 1982, and that GE stock will help put my children through college. But just last month, there was an announcement the plant would close down. 147 jobs would be lost. The plant was in place since 1946. And I enjoyed working there. I worked there for two years. But the reason it shut down wasn't because it was moving to China. It was because of technological change. And GE released this report that said, in the last decade, the lighting industry has seen major technological pivot away from traditional lighting products, incandescent halogen, especially fluorescent lighting. Consumer demand for traditional lighting is an all-time low. And the US government has forced regulations that will phase out incandescent bulbs. We're moving to LED, and LED is produced in other facilities uh, in, around the country. So technological change brought about the end of a wonderful factory that was in place in, for 70 years. So sometimes globalization is blamed for economic change in which it really wasn't. It was technological change, and technological change is sometimes brutal, but it's unstoppable. We must look for ways to help those people of Murray, Kentucky, who were laid off and lost their jobs at Fisher Price and Tap, and find ways to be reemployed back into the workforce. And maybe it's not in that hometown, maybe it's somewhere else. But if we forget about them, then we'll end up with political actors and politicians and leaders who will lead us down some blind alleys. We also help, have to help the next generation, those people who are going to live to be 105, who will have multiple careers over uh, 60 years and to be able to be re-educated and re-trained and a culture of re-education and training. And we need to create an enabling environment for capital formation, job creation, and entrepreneurship. We need more capitalism, not less. But we need inclusive capitalism. As Jesse Jackson said, capitalism without capital is just another ism. And that's true. We need to find ways to put capital in the hands of those who are at the bottom of the pyramid, those with great ideas, those with great inspiration, those who are willing to employ that capital, and as I noted earlier in my remarks, oftentimes it's an immigrant population. If we don't do that, then we're going to confront the rhetoric that it's a rigged system and it's unfair. Let me close before I invite out Douglas uh, on a musical note, which may seem odd. I was in South Africa last week in our dinner event, we had a young poet, a uh, playwright. Her name is Napa Masciani, and she's fabulous. And she and I were in the green room getting mic'd up before she went on stage, and I had to do my usual thank you for the evening. And she said something to me that music is the language that offers insight into the soul. Now, I thought that was pretty epiphanal, but maybe you think it's axiomatic. I don't know. But the way she said it, it really, it really uh, moved me. And I think through music, we can truly appreciate the emotions, the experience, and the attitudes of those who feel disconnected from our political system and from our economy, why we need to find ways to include them in our economic system. And it's cr true across all music genres. Rock and roll, Bruce Springsteen has a new biography out, and there are songs like Youngstown and The Ghost of Tom Joad which, of course, is based on Steinbeck's novel, The Grapes of Wrath. I did take my kids to the Steinbeck Center in Salinas, California, to which they complained bitterly that it was not Disneyland. But it's a wonderful place. If you go to Salinas, California, go to the John Steinbeck Center. But it's not just rock. There's hip-hop, Kane West, Spaceship, Cameron, I Hate My Job, country music, Merle Haggard's Working Man Blues, Brooks and Dunn, Hard Working Man, Classical, I still think Aaron Copeland's fanfare for the common man says something about today, even though it was written seven years ago. 
and jazz, Terrence Blanchard's A Tale of God's Will, which is about New Orleans after Katrina, but it's about a group of people who felt that they'd been forgotten and abandoned. I'm sure there's a great reggae song as well. I don't know reggae, so I'll defer to others who maybe can suggest something. But I want to end on a blues note. I've been listening to a lot of blues lately. Maybe it's just the political environment. And in fact, we'll have the complete blues playlist tonight at our campaign cocktails where we're going to get a campaign update from my good friends Charlie Cook and Stu Rothenberg. So I hope that you'll attend tonight. And it's a song entitled Ordinary Man by Smokin' Joe Kubik and Bonus King. Unfortunately, Smokin' Joe is no longer alive. He passed away last year. But I think they capture the moment for many Americans in this song. So if you bear with me, I'm not going to sing it. It goes like this. Politicians in their parties playing games with my life. I've gone and lost my job. It's causing trouble with my wife. I'm just an ordinary man trying to live a decent life. Got to take care of my kids. Staying married would be nice. Tired of hearing about all the polls. Tired of hearing statistics. Those folks up on the hill, they seem a little sadistic. Well, I don't think it takes a genius to figure those people out. Put on a suit, wave old glory. Seems that's what it's all about. Well, they say they know what people want, but no, nobody's asking me a thing. It's just the right and the left. Man, those are old polls games. I'm done listening because I know nothing is going to change. Makes no difference who's in power. You know it's just going to stay the same. They say together we stand, divided we'll fall. But when the voting is over, they forget about us all. I'm just an ordinary man trying to live a decent life, trying to take care of my kids and hold on to my wife. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. <laughs>